Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to C4C Apologetics. Today we have another interview. We're going to be looking a little more about eschatology, end times, messianic kingdom, things of that nature. And with me, we have none other than Dr. Jody Dillo. And so many of you are very familiar with him. If not maybe the person, you're most likely familiar with these books behind me with Reign of the Servant Kings and Final Destiny. Uh, Dr. Dillo is a uh, graduate from DTS. I believe it's New Testament Greek, if I'm not mistaken, was your major uh, yeah. with a THD. Uh, he was a founder over 40 years of the Biblical Education by Extension Ministry, which basically seeks to go ahead and provide biblical training and biblical education to those Christians within closed countries. And then uh, as opposed to these two books, he's written numerous other books as well. So you can check them out on Grace Theology Press, I believe it is. You can check it out on uh, Amazon and a lot of other places to go ahead and get those. So Jody, I appreciate you sharing your time with us to be here this morning. Is there anything you'd like to share before we get into the interview? Anything about yourself, ministries, anything you're doing currently? Is there anything you'd like to share? Oh, well, not really. I mean, <laughs> I'm glad to be here. I'm married to a fabulous wife. We have 10 grandkids. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> uh, five kids, four kids now. One of them is with the Lord. She died last year, Oh. Uh, which has been tough for us, obviously. Yeah. But no, I, I'm doing well. I'm still somewhat involved in, we call it BEE -E World, B -E -E Biblical World. Education by Extension World. And as you said, our thing has been uh, delivering advanced uh, biblical training, mm -hmm. uh, primarily in closed countries, uh, mm -hmm. covert extension biblical training huh. in uh, many countries. We're in the Middle East. We started out in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and then on to China, uh, Vietnam, uh, Korea, and other places. So anyway, that's enough. <laughs> now that's fascinating. Do you find that there's a there's a hunger for deeper theological education over there in closed countries? Oh yeah. I mean, we've met some of the most godly and enthusiastic people we've ever met uh, in these countries. Yeah. Uh, they are very motivated. We've got like a, what, 20 course curriculum that's roughly a first year Bible college level. Oh, wow. And uh, uh, it's all taught on a, a facilitation mode. Mm -hmm. So they do the lessons, which requires about three hours a lesson. It's fairly serious stuff. Yeah. But uh, it assumes an educational and analytical ability of someone who's 12 years of age. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, has 12, 12 years grade. of school. 12th grade. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so anyway, that's what we do. And we find an enormous hunger for a deeper study of scripture uh, all over the world. That's amazing. A lot of times when I think of like persecuted church and you think of Voice of the Martyrs or Open Doors USA, uh, you really get this aspect that they're very evangelical, but... It, it does, you never really hear much that they're really wanting to be very theological, if you will. So they want to give the gospel, share the gospel, but to really get deep and be those theological nerds like we are, uh, it's fascinating to see that there is that hunger still. And I guess that hunger is just innate of just people and the giftedness they have when they come to Christ and the desires the Spirit lays on them. So that's fascinating. Yeah, well, I'm. Uh, they're not as nerdy as we are, <laughs> but uh, they are really hunger, hungry yeah. because we work primarily with church leaders, and mm -hmm. they realize that they need a much stronger biblical foundation to adequately lead their church, whether it's a pastor uh, or just elders or Bible study leaders in the church. Right. No, that's amazing. That's that's awesome. So we're going to have a link for that. Uh, I, there's a website link for BEE, correct? BEE World? That's yeah, BEEWorld.org. Okay. We're going to have that link in the descriptions. I encourage you to check it out and see how you can get involved or at least pray for the ministry as well. Uh, like I said, in this interview, we're going to be talking about uh, eschatological things, maybe uh, Messianic Kingdom stuff, questions of revelation, things like that. But before we get into that, uh, this was a question that you actually uh, pose, and it's a fascinating question because as somebody within ministry, it's a question I get very regularly. Matter of fact, last night at church, I was just talking to somebody about the, how to discern 
between our will and God's will or our leading in the Holy Spirit's leading for us to do something. And so I'd like to ask you that question. How can we know if we are hearing the voice of God when we're trying to discern his leading? How can we know and discern? Yeah, this is obviously a very uh, common uh, question that people have. And one of the things that uh, has always troubled me a little bit is that mm -hmm. people rely pretty uh, pretty much on a, a, an inner voice, mm -hmm. which is true. There is God does lead. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of his voices. So he uh, uh, we pray about it and we get an inclination and mm -hmm. there's a pretty quick assumption made sometimes by many Christians. Oh, that's what God wants me to do. Okay. It may be, but uh, I thought I'd write out my thoughts about this. Uh, and in fact, I can send you a little paper I wrote. It's just a couple of pages. Definitely. There's actually seven voices of God, <laughs> according to the Bible. Yeah. And sometimes we place uh, most, or in some cases, always uh, all of our emphasis on that inner voice, which okay. is a valid one. Mm -hmm. And so briefly, uh, we can't, we could spend a whole hour on this, but what are the seven voices? Yeah. Well, I'm just uh, identifying these from scripture itself. Okay. And the first one is circumstances. Uh, and that comes out of the fact that God is sovereign over all things. So we need to look at the details of what's okay. going on around us. And uh, all scripture is, uh, you know, inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, right. reproof, correction, and training righteousness. Okay, well, how does God reveal his will through the scriptures? Mm -hmm. Well, he does it in four ways. Okay. First of all, there's biblical absolutes. And I'm I, I'm not going to quote verses here, uh, but first Corinthians right. 10, 14. But secondly, there's biblical principles. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, be willing to deny yourself. Mm -hmm. Be willing yeah. to place the kingdom of God as your first priority, that kind of thing. First right. Corinthians 10, 33. The third uh, way that God speaks through scripture is through biblical examples. You know, Paul speaks of this in first Corinthians 10 now, where he says these things happened as examples for us, yeah. referring yeah. to the experience of the Hebrews in the wilderness. Right. And then the final way God speaks through scripture is biblical wisdom. Mm. And he wrote a whole book about it, <laughs> the book <laughs> yes. of Proverbs. So I think to practically apply it, it's probably yeah. good if you're make, facing a major, you know, decision to look for his voice in Proverbs yeah. and read through it. Yeah. Uh, that's the first voice, scripture. The second voice that scripture mm. says how God speaks is through counselors. Mm. Uh, like Proverbs eleven fourteen, where there is no guidance, a nation falls, but with the abundance of counselors, there is safety. Yep. But you got to be sure to pick the right kind of counselors, oh, people yeah. who are mature in Christ, right. and who have demonstrated uh, that by living Christ's way of life, mm -hmm. and counselors who have demonstrated wisdom and who know the scriptures. The third way that God speaks is by inner motivations mm -hmm. uh you know it's not wrong to do what you want to do just because no. you want to do it that doesn't mean it couldn't be god's will because right. that would be selfish and i'm looking at philippians 2 uh, 12 uh yeah. you know where paul says so then my beloved as you've always obeyed not in my presence only, but also much more in my absence. Yeah. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And here's the verse. For it is God who is at work in you both to will yeah. and to work for his good pleasure. Yeah. So if you have a desire to do something, that doesn't necessarily mean it's self-centered. Might be. Right. But you need to look at that as a possible voice of God. That's one mm -hmm. of the ways he leads us, according to that passage. So a, is, so, yeah, so a desire. So a desire to do desire. What do you What do you want to do? Right. <laughs> it's okay to think about that. Yeah. Uh, the next one is a life message. Mm. Uh, is this uh, urge consistent with my life message? Mm. And what do I mean by a life message? Well, it's right. a unique expression of Christ's way of life 
that he wants to work out in your personal experience. Hmm. Uh, it, it answers the question, why am I here? And your right. awareness of your message helps you discern whether a certain urge or inclination mm -hmm. is from God. Well, what's a life message? Mm -hmm. Well, it involves how he designed you, first of all. And we know right. that from Psalm 139, right. that he was working out who you were in the womb. Yeah. But secondly, it involves your spiritual gift. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, whatever your gift is, and you learn that many times by experience, that's mm -hmm. another uh, question. But is this urge or inclination consistent with how God has demonstrated uh, my gift? Right. And then, of course, your circumstances and experience of life, they shape who you are. Mm -hmm. So one check uh, or one way, one aspect of the life message is how he's been leading you through life and the experiences that, that mm. you've had. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, then the next uh, way that he leads and the one that, you know, we generally rely on, I think probably yeah. too much, is okay. inner conviction from the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, we know from the book of Nehemiah, in fact, many, many scriptures. I remember I spent several weeks once mm -hmm. going through all the passages in the Bible uh, where the words lead, guide, teach, instruct were yeah. used with God as a subject. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Nehemiah 7, 5 says, then God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles. So it's okay. absolutely true that God plants uh, an inclination mm -hmm. uh, in the heart. So we need yeah. to look at that. My my only uh, caution here is that we tend to place all of our emphasis on that, in mm. one, many cases at least. Yeah. And then the final one, voice of God, is which course of action gives God the greatest, greatest glory? glory. Yep. Uh, you know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Yep. And uh, so you kind of ask, is this passive? is the path that I'm inclined to do here, or that yeah. I think God might be speaking to me internally about, would that bring, which one of these inclinations would bring the most glory to him? <laughs> Obviously, that's subjective uh, in many cases, but All sometimes right. it's really helpful to think about that oh, yeah. uh, as a as an important aspect of the decision-making so there's seven voices of God, not just one. And obviously, you can't go through all seven of those every time you want a parking place <laughs> <laughs> or, or or do make some course of action. Right. But it's important, I think, to keep all of that in mind and, yeah. and reflect on them. And one thing that's always struck me is you go through the New Testament. Mm -hmm. There's no place where Paul says, now, brethren, I, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning impressions. Mm -hmm. How do you know, Paul might say, which are from God and which are just your own psychology or inclinations? Mm -hmm. And Paul never gives any guidance. Mm. So it's kind of surprising since that is so central in the life of right. many Christians today that the New Testament never tells us, That's gives true. us any guidance on how to know. Well, it does indirectly through these other seven voices. Yeah. No, that's... <laughs> but, but That's you know you don't have Paul breaking it out and saying, "Okay, right. here's the seven voices." You sort of pick this up by your general reading of the New Testament, right? No, definitely. Now, is this these seven ways? Is this captured in a book that you have authored? No, it's in a. Uh, I just have a little PDF. I'll be happy to send it to you, and you can send it out to any readers who want Please, it. Please, I. I'd love to be able to go ahead and share that with people and definitely be a blessing and a resource for people to understand and discern more. Like, like you mentioned that a lot of times and more often than not, we, we take the impulse, the inner yeah. drive, if you will. And that's the only thing we really focus on as opposed to the other ways. And I don't know what's that. Now, well, what I thought about this, you know, we all get these impulses and they're mm -hmm. hard to distinguish from an aha moment in the shower about something else. Uh, right. Similar right. feelings. I, yeah. I, I, you know, what is what? Well, you know, I, I have these seven voices, but uh, sometimes you got to make a decision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And I, you know, I, I check it 
you know, with scripture and whatnot. But right. generally speaking, I think, well, gee, if this is a good thing to do and it's consistent with scripture, yeah. I'll just go ahead and do it uh, and assume that it's God's will. Uh, and it's not yep. going to be disastrous if it's not. It's a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I know it, a lot of times, you know, when we're talking out here locally with different people, it's like we want to place Gideon's fleece out two or three times yeah, to get yeah. signs uh, yeah. answered, if you will, signs uh, <laughs> revealed. But I know when uh, when I was retiring from the military and there's an opportunity to go full time uh, associate pastor here at our church. Uh because we were already here before, I knew a lot of the people. I knew the ministry. I knew the senior pastor. I loved the guy. I loved his wife. And so there was a desire. I had a, I wanted to do it, you know? And so the hardest part in, like you said, safety and the multitude of counselors, I remember I emailed six people that were in full-time ministry, all yeah. the same questions. And one of the questions on there was, is it wrong to take a position simply because I desire to? And because yeah. it's comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I got some really great answers and, and counsel on that. Yeah. But uh, like you said, which of the choices does God get the most glory? I love that too, because when a lot of people ask me as far as gray areas, should I or should I not do this? Uh, I ultimately just go back to them and say, how does God get the glory in it? Right. If you can justify God is glorified in this gray area, then Christian liberty do it. But yeah, if you can't very, reconcile very healthy to think through that. Yeah. And so I definitely appreciate that. I would love to get a link to that and we could put it on the descriptions here. I could also throw it on our website for C4C apologetics.com for anybody that wants to go ahead and uh, get that information as well. And sure. so that would be awesome. Thanks, Jody. Uh, moving on to some theological questions. Well, I guess every question really is theological in nature. They're all about God. But looking at more es eschatology, uh, pre-trib or pre-wrath. I really don't want to talk about mid-trib or post-trib, but uh, as far as the rapture is concerned, which do you find most biblical and why? Pre-trib or pre-wrath? And can you explain a little bit what the difference is between the two? Well, <clears throat> the difference really between the two is when does the wrath begin? Mm, the wrath of God, because right? We all agree, well, yeah, the, the, those who accept pre-wrath as the basis, they want to locate the beginning of the wrath mm -hmm. in the middle of the tribulation, or even like in the case of Robert Gundry, towards the end of it. Okay. That's that's where the wrath begins. Uh, so that's that's the issue, and because we are told in 1 Thessalonians 5 mm -hmm. that God has not appointed us to wrath. wrath. Right. So... In the wrath, in that context, it wait first. That's five, two. I, well, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm having a memory years? problem here. <laughs> but uh, he's not appointed us to wrath, but to salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, by salvation, it means rescue from the coming wrath in the in the day of the Lord. In the mm -hmm. in the context, well, when does this day of the Lord begin? When does the wrath begin? And uh, in favor of the um, free wrath view right uh they can point to scriptures in uh, the book of revelation that identify the wrath of god mm -hmm. as occurring somewhere in the middle or in the second half or towards the end mm -hmm. but uh i don't think that's sufficient because if you look at the uh, seven seals right that open the book of revelation you know there's pestilence warfare warfare right. And all this stuff is coming from heaven, from mm -hmm. God, and it's clearly wrath. Mm -hmm. yes. So for me, even though even if the word is not used, that's irrelevant. Right. Uh, the, the Bible says that the wrath of God begins with the opening of the first seal mm -hmm. and the opening uh, moment of the uh, of the tribulus tribulation. Right. So without getting into any more detail. That's the question. If you accept that premise, then you're pre-trib. Mm -hmm. No, I, I I like how you pointed out the whole seal judgments because when you're in Revelation chapter six, and uh, you get in verse one with the first seal, the seal judgment, 
uh, like you said, they're they're clearly uh, uh, being sent, if you will, from heaven. From because heaven, it's the yeah, lamb so, that opens it. And they're not good stuff. They're his anger at the unbelieving world. You know, right. it's his wrath. So, at any rate, that that settled that problem with yeah. pre tribulationism for me. Definitely, and and I guess, like you said, the argument could be when's the wrath of God? Because uh, from what I understand, they'll look at those judgments as mankind's right. uh, aspect. But like you said, there's famines, there's pestilences. Uh, I don't know of any man uh, that can really cause a <laughs> pestilence, uh, locusts yeah. and plague. Now, yeah. famine maybe, but so I did appreciate that. Uh, I did want to ask you this question. I, I, I know you mentioned a little bit or quite a bit, uh, if you will, in your books, but in Matthew 7, in John 3, in a couple other places, there's terminology that says, enter the kingdom. Okay. Uh, it says, if you want to, John chapter three, verse number five says, uh, uh, you must be born of water and spirit to be able to enter the kingdom. Yeah. But then you get into first Corinthians six, nine, Galatians five, 21, and other verses in the new Testament, where more often than not, it's listing bad deeds, bad works. And he's saying, if you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's interesting because entering from my understanding, the terminology isn't used after Acts. And so is there a difference between entering the kingdom and inheriting the kingdom? If there is a difference, what is the difference? If they're synonymous, could you explain a little bit why uh, works would keep us from inheriting? So could you elaborate a little on that? Yeah, you're getting into a uh, a very important issue in terms of understanding uh, the New Testament. Uh, first of all, it, it's it's healthy to consider what is the gospel of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And we tend to reduce that to one of two things. Uh, either one, uh, entering the future kingdom of God in a as, uh, as a saved person mm -hmm. or two being born again so entrance uh, into the kingdom is to be born again mm -hmm. that's true that the the uh the phrase kingdom of god or kingdom of heaven which by the way i think are basically synonymous, synonymous. phrases mm -hmm. uh are used that way but what a lot of people don't realize if you if you take out if you look up all the references to the kingdom mm -hmm. Uh, there are six different aspects of this kingdom. Hmm. Uh, first of all, it's used of the Messianic banquet, which uh, inaugurates the kingdom of God on earth. Mm -hmm. It's not the whole kingdom. It's just the banquet. Right. Secondly, it's used of power. For example, uh, if I cast out demons, uh, hmm. how's it go by the uh, the power of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. So in that passage, the kingdom of God is really when he's he's speaking of the power of God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, also, there is uh, the kingdom is used in Matthew 13 of mm -hmm. a permeating influence mm -hmm. that affects the course of life in the current age. Uh, the kingdom is also used of an experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the kingdom of God is love, joy, and rejoicing in the Holy Spirit, Paul says. Mm -hmm. Or in Matthew 6, 33, uh, seek ye first his kingdom and his, his righteousness. righteousness. Uh, and that righteousness, uh, we'll talk about that in a moment, is a kingdom way of life. Okay. Uh, it's obedience. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it's used in the phrase messianic kingdom. Mm -hmm. And of course, there it has a, a salvation or soteriological uh, idea in it. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of look at the context to see what is being spoken of hmm. about the kingdom in that particular context. Okay, having said that, um, a verse that <clears throat> that uh, got me going on this yeah. is Matthew 5, 20, where Jesus says to the apostles now these are believers the 12 right and he says to these believers seek ye first uh 
no, he, he says, unless your righteousness mm -hmm. exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Right. Well, he's talking now to people who are already in the kingdom of God in a soteriological sense, okay. the 12 apostles. Mm. So there's another way that you can enter. And the, the other way is to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. <laughs> now, in order to solve this difficulty, uh, a lot of people say, well, that must be the imputed righteousness of Christ. That's the greater righteousness. Mm. However, if you look up all, I think there's 12 usages of righteousness uh -huh. in the Gospel of Matthew, it all always refers to moral, ethical righteousness, to a way mm -hmm. of living, a godly way of living. It never refers to uh, a legal righteousness imputed mm -hmm. right. uh, you know, to the uh, to the believer at the point in time he believes in Christ. But more than that, in the very next verse in Matthew 21 and following, he defines what that righteousness is. Mm -hmm. He says it's inner, not external. For example, he says, if you've ever lusted after a woman, you've already committed yeah. uh, adultery and in you're in subject heart, to judgment. Huh? So the or if you've uh, angry with a mm -hmm. brother, you've already committed murder in your right. heart. So he's defining that righteousness just just not in terms of simple external obedience to laws, but internal obedience to the spirit of the law. And uh, the Pharisees and the Jews in the first century had largely reduced it to, well, if I've obeyed the external command. You know, mm -hmm. I may have lusted after a woman, but I still haven't committed adultery. Right. And Jesus is elevating that righteousness to a whole new level mm -hmm. that it's internal. So when he said what what the Sermon on the Mount is and what that verse is about, mm -hmm. it's a calling to believers to live a kingdom way of life. And sometimes uh, entering the kingdom means is a call to enter into the kingdom way of life, not into salvation or into the future millennium. Okay. And that's how it's defined in Matthew 5, 20 and, and the verses following. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about entering the kingdom and entering and inheriting the kingdom, mm -hmm. you first of all need to understand, well, what do you mean by entering the kingdom? And it depends again on the context. Right. But that said, uh, entering the kingdom can mean entering to salvation. It mm -hmm. can also mean entering into a kingdom way of living mm -hmm. and, and other things. Right. It can mean experience the power of the kingdom. But an inheritance is ownership in mm -hmm. that kingdom. And there's two kinds of inheritance talked about in the Bible. Uh, first uh, is the inheritance that comes to us by faith alone in Christ alone, and it's awarded to all believers on the basis of faith alone apart from works. Mm. I call that the salvation inheritance. Okay. That's referred to in a number of places throughout the New Testament uh, where it talks about inheriting the kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, the other uh, use of her inheritance, and all you have to do is look up every, every <laughs> example yeah. in the Old Testament or New Testament of the verb to inherit or the noun inheritance. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that many, many places it's based on works. Yeah. So you, you have in the New Testament itself, two kinds of inheritance, a, a salvation inheritance, which comes to all believer mm -hmm. through faith alone. Uh, and then you have a reward inheritance, mm -hmm. which is merited based upon a faithful life. And there's many passages where these verbs uh, reward, uh, There's, I think there's about six of them that refer to payment for work done right. is the inheritance. So the, the simplest way that I could see to harmonize all that is to say, well, just like 
there are different ways of uh, not different ways. There's different kinds of salvation, mm -hmm. salvation from trouble or difficulty or armies right. or whatnot. There's also salvation uh, from hell, mm -hmm. but there's also uh, salvation in the sense of a uh, of a rich life. Mm. Uh, kind of sanctification salvation so just like the the uh, salvation can mean different things depending on the context mm -hmm. so can the inheritance mean different things so you have to look at the context and how do you know which is which well mm -hmm. if it's based on works and it's rewarded for payment by uh by, of work done right uh then this is the reward inheritance mm -hmm. the crowns the higher places of honor in the kingdom Mm -hmm. the enhanced intimacy with the king in the future kingdom. Uh, all of these things are promised to the believer who is faithful to the end. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, is there a difference between inheriting the kingdom and uh, entering right. the kingdom? Yep, but you need to look at context for each one to see what difference is being discussed. So would it... so? It would be an oversimplification uh, to say that entering is about access and inheriting is about authority. Would that be an oversimplification? Uh, the inheriting is authority. Yeah, that, that's okay, but it, mm -hmm. I think it's broader than that. Yeah, It's a reward for faithful work. Right. And it refers to all of those rewards, not mm -hmm. just the reward of reigning with him. Okay, true. Right. Now, when I went through the New Testament and looked at these rewards, yeah, and I, I think this is accurate, they they boil down to three categories of rewards. Okay. One of them is uh ruling with him. Mm -hmm. Some believers will rule with him, some will not. Right. The second category is enhanced intimacy with him. Mm. And I went to the passages of attendance at the wedding feast of the lamb mm -hmm. or attendance at the messianic banquet. And these are only granted to those believers who have lived faithfully to the end of life. I love when uh, you, you mentioned that. Could I, I, yeah, I know this wasn't ahead. on script, but okay. So the, the wedding supper of the lamb in revelation 19, in the beginning part of the chapter, uh, a am I off believing that those invited to that wedding supper of the Lamb are those faithful Christians? Or do Correct. you believe that's all Christians? Yeah, he's, yeah, he said they're defined as uh, having done the righteousness of God, which is good works. Mm -hmm. And some Christians do it and some Christians don't. Example, right. Solomon. He finished his life he's obviously a believer right uh, by any criteria even those who don't accept this theology have a problem with solomon right. as you look at all the all the characteristics of his life but towards the end of his life he fell away and he started worshiping Baals. Mm -hmm. so solomon's going to be uh in the kingdom but he won't be at the table right Okay, so I, I I thought I was only one of the very few that actually believe that the wedding supper of the lamb uh, was only for the it, it's a rewards invitation. That's right, and you service. are one of the few. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like I'm in good company though. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm just trying to harmonize all the scripture and yeah. not impose a theological system on it to make it work. This way, I can just uh, look more closely at each text. Right. In fact, as I started this journey, and it took me, gosh, over 12, 16 years, mm -hmm. I, I did start with an assumption because I'm looking at these contradictions yeah. between salvation by faith alone mm -hmm. and salvation by faith plus works, which the Catholics uh, and the Mormons and others have camped on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm trying to, well, suppose we looked at that from the standpoint of uh, the one, the, the aspect of salvation that's talked about in this passage by works has nothing to do with entrance. It has to do with the reward. Right. And what I was encouraged to find is that it worked across yeah. the board. It made right. sense in every context. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't problems with this view, but mm -hmm. there's enormous problems with those who try to to harmonize these things 
by saying that the, the righteousness is the justifying righteousness of God. Right. He granted its faith. So I, I, I began to conclude, yeah, both views have problems, but this view, so-called free grace, has fewer problems. Right. No, I, I definitely, I, I love that right there because, yes, everybody comes to Scripture with presuppositions. I mean, Correct. no one comes to Scripture without any bias, if you will. The problem is when we refuse to challenge our presupposition. Exactly. And the yeah. key thing is when we're looking at the totality of Scripture, we also got to not only look at the book context, historically, what's happening in the letter or whatever, but we also have to look at it systematically. What does the whole entirety word of God say about salvation? Is salvation faith alone or is there an aspects of works? If we know the entirety of scripture is faith alone in Christ alone, then we know any passage that talks about works can't mean it's for eternal life. Because yeah. that's contrary. And so I love the aspect you brought out, the context and the systematic theology as well. Uh, another debatable uh, topic, if you will, is that of outer darkness. Now, outer darkness is a term used three times, and it's only used in the Gospel of Matthew. Could you explain what is outer darkness? What is this aspect of weeping and gnashing of teeth? Is it a reference of hell or is it something else? Could you elaborate on that? Obviously, this is a tough, tough passage uh, for uh, free grace believers such as me. Mm -hmm. It's also a difficult passage. Uh, it's not as difficult for reformed believers because they can just say, well, these are non-believers and they're right. going to hell. Uh, the way I came at it uh, contextually, uh, he's talking about it, what is he being cast out of? Mm -hmm. And uh, in these verses, he's already, the, the person that's getting cast out is already in the kingdom. Mm. Uh, that means he's born again. Mm -hmm. He's being cast out of the wedding feast or the messianic banquet. Mm. And uh, it's darkness outside is not hell. It's the darkness outside of the lit banquet hall inside the new jerusalem during the tribulation period okay. or at the beginning of the uh millennium so what he's being cast out of is not into hell but out of the intimate fellowship with the faithful who have persevered in a life of good works to the end of life now when he when he's cast out of that and his whole life is paraded before him Mm -hmm. and he sees that his life has amounted to nothing that it's worthless mm -hmm. and that his behavior uh was ple displeasing from god for most of the time that he was a christian uh there's profound regret and there's weeping and gnashing of teeth the gnashing of teeth is normally a symbol of anger so mm. sometimes they're just going to be angry at God. Mm. Now, the question, uh, how long does this grief last? Right. Is he going to go through, uh, you know, eternity in heaven, just full of grief and remorse and bad memories and shame? Mm. No, because uh, the book of Revelation says in two places that uh, God will wipe away every tear. <laughs> And also Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 2, about how glorious and wonderful and fantastic, uh, <laughs> you know, the experience of eternal life with Christ will be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I remember once I was teaching this to a group of people, mm -hmm. and uh, one guy came up to me afterwards, and he said, you mean to tell me that a person can, uh, you know, live his life uh claim to be a christian and, and live poorly maybe mm -hmm. even fall away and still mm -hmm. go to heaven when he dies and uh, and i said yeah he says well that's not strong enough he's got to have the fear of hell over his head which is the reform or the armenian view yeah. or there's not enough motivation to shape up and the free grace view says grace with accountability mm -hmm. the accountability however is not uh, loss of salvation and or like with the Arminian right. or condemnation 
uh, to hell uh, by the reformed persuasion, uh, but it's final accountability to the judgment seat of Christ when you'll experience profound regret mm -hmm. and forfeit future opportunities to reign with Christ, future rewards, and future degree of intimacy that you could have had. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the negative consequence that free grace offers. And if somebody doesn't think that that's sufficient enough motivation to cause somebody to, to live correctly, right. well, that's the motivation that ought to be a very sufficient motivation. Because Paul said that the crown of righteousness in 1 Timothy 4 is awarded to all those who have loved his appearing. <laughs> that is, longed for that chance to stand before him and mm -hmm. be intimate with him. Yeah. And that and regulate their lives in view of loving his appearance, their final accountability for their lives. Mm -hmm. That's the motivation that Paul sets before them. Now, regarding the believer, uh, uh, the person who claims he's a believer yeah. and doesn't act like it, let me say, first of all, according to my understanding of the New Testament, all true believers will profess and exhibit some good works and love for God. <laughs> the question that's before us is not whether that happens, because we all agree that that will happen. The question is, will they persevere in it to the end of life? All right. That's what all the warnings in the New Testament are about. Mm -hmm. They're not warning the, the believer about uh, going to hell, but they're warning him that if he doesn't persevere in good works to the end of life, there will be a consequences at the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, <clears throat> you know, the, the, uh, uh, the Catholics came after Calvin on this issue mm -hmm. and they uh, argued that works were necessary to the end of life. If a guy's living a bad life, he couldn't be, or, okay. uh, you know, he's not a Christian. Well, Calvin essentially said uh, that if you are not living the life, that means you were never born again to begin with. Now, actually, Calvin didn't state that explicitly, mm -hmm. but his, uh, uh, how do you say, <laughs> the guy who took over his role in Geneva. Okay, predecessor. The Theodore Beza. Mm. It, said that if if you're not living the life, that means you were never born again to begin with and you're going to hell. The Arminians say, if you're not living the life, you had salvation, but you lost, lost it, it. And you're going to hell. So both Arminians and Reform agree, if you're not living the life, you're going to hell. Uh, the free grace view is, if you're truly born again, you're not going to hell because Jesus said in John uh, 6, what is it, 47 about, that if you believe on me, uh, you will have uh, eternal life. You'll be raised up in the last day, and and I will not lose any of them. Mm. Amen. Amen. So Jesus has put his seal of approval on the fact mm. if a person is is born again, uh, that he will uh, enter the kingdom in a soteriological way, and he'll be saved, and he won't experience eternal damnation. Right. So free grace is not cheap grace. It's grace with accountability, but it's not the accountability of hanging the threat of eternal damnation over the right. believer's head all of his life, which is basically what the reform yeah. and the Arminians do. No, yeah, I like that, you know, grace with accountability. I, I think a lot of times most people, when someone of the free grace like us, we want to go ahead and explain this aspect of the judgment seat of Christ, which from what I understand, covenant theologians, they they conflate great white throne judgment and the Bema seat yeah, judgment. Yeah, yeah. But when we talk about the judgment seat of Christ and the fact that a Christian can be called an unfaithful, unprofitable servant, and that there's going to be remorse and regret there, I think most people don't understand how serious and how deep that regret will be. It's like once the moment our faith becomes sight and we really truly see resurrected Messiah and we're standing before him, if we lived a very shallow Christian life, yes, I imagine there's going to be entirely a lot of regrets because we're going to be standing before him and finally see him 
Now, thankfully, we're still going to be saved because, like you said, in the Holy Spirit's a down payment earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of our body. So even the sealing of the Holy Spirit preserves us uh, unto salvation. But I think a lot of people overlook this aspect of regret that, you know, I might have a regret for some things that I've done unfaithfully too that we'll have one day when faith becomes sight. And so, yeah, you know, one uh, I read a dissert, doctor's dissertation uh -huh. by a guy that wrote his dissertation on this subject. Okay. And he criti criticized the view that I'm suggesting here. I don't think he mentioned me by name, but it was the free grace review mm -hmm. and our accountability is loss of intimacy opportunities to serve Christ throughout all eternity mm -hmm. uh, in a greater degree, reigning with him and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, well, that's just a temporary inconvenience. And I was astounded that uh, anybody could say that the loss of those th three things was a temporary inconvenience. Uh, it's not. It's going to be profoundly regretted, and there's going to be weeping at a failed life. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to long. We need to live loving His appearing. Paul said. Mm. Yep. Amen. It's like the saying goes: uh, "You don't work for salvation; you work because of salvation, right. or you work it out." Paul right. said <laughs> in We're... Philippians two. No, I, I appreciate that. And then as far as outer darkness is concerned, you're right. When you're looking at the passage in Matthew chapter 8, uh, it says in verse 12, the children of the kingdom will be cast out. So they're yeah. in the kingdom. <laughs> then when you get to Matthew chapter number 22, and I believe it's in verse number 13, uh, the king says to the servants, uh, take him out. And this is at a wedding, uh, a wedding aspect. And so when you're looking at the context on where these people are being removed from, it does point to the fact that it seems like they're in some aspect of uh, God's presence. And it's mm. not that they're losing their salvation, it's that they're losing an aspect of reward, a closeness, an intimacy, a blessing, if you will, like you had mentioned. So I appreciated that. Yeah, let me emphasize one thing, you know, uh -huh. what they're what they're. Uh, I don't I don't know I said this clearly, but okay. one of the things that they are losing is greater opportunities to serve the king throughout eternity. That's mm -hmm. what that parable about five cities and ten cities and no cities is about. It's not about uh, you know, being the mayor of some city. <laughs> <laughs> there these are metaphors for opportunity to serve. Mm -hmm. And some of us are going to have more opportunities than others. Yeah. Amen. I appreciate that. And I think that was in Matthew 25, I think is uh, the parable, if I'm not mistaken, that you're talking about there. Yeah. And so I appreciate that. Uh, one other uh, sort of controversial, if you will, I think there's a variance of opinions and thoughts, even within free grace theology. But when we get to Matthew 25, we're getting to the parable of the sheep and the goats in this judgment. And Jesus does state that for as much as you do it to one of these, you've done it to me. And when you don't do it, you don't do it to me. It, it seems like Jesus was teaching a works-based salvation. Uh, can you explain the parable of the sheep and the goats, the, the separating of the sheep and the goats? Uh, when is this happening? And is this a works-based thing or is this a rewards? What is the point of that parable? Well, you know, this, uh, yeah, this is a difficult uh parable uh to fit but um my own take on it is first of all who's he talking to mm -hmm. he's talking to the disciples believing people and uh, then he expands it on to all the uh believing people mm -hmm. and some uh do good works and some don't and there are eternal consequences involved. And the sheep are true believers, and the goats uh, are believers who have fallen away. Mm -hmm. That's how I take it. And uh, these are believers who have failed to uh, honor Christ. Let me just open that scripture 
Okay, definitely. Uh, one or, let me let me open my yep. Bible here. Matthew 25, uh, 36. Uh, uh, actually, it starts in 31, and it goes all the way to 46, where 46 yeah. says, and these will go away in everlasting punishment and the righteous exactly. unto uh, uh, life eternal. Okay, let me bring it up here so I'm yeah. talking intelligently about the particular <laughs> verses. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, I know this is part of a greater uh, discourse on the Mount of Olives, beginning in Matthew chapter number 24, answering a few questions that the apostles have about the return of Christ, the time, the signs, and things like that. And then it seems like he gets into this part about later in the period. In a... Yeah, it's, apparently this is at the second advent. Okay. Um, at least that's how I take it. And mm -hmm. uh, he's going to separate uh, the sheep from the goats. This is mm -hmm. a question. And he's going to put the, you know, the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Mm -hmm. And the criteria seems to be uh, that the sheep will inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. Okay. And why do they? So it clearly in this passage is not referring to salvation. It's referring to good works. The mm -hmm. result in uh, this inheritance. So it's not a salvation inheritance. It's a reward inheritance. Right. This is proven by the following verses where he enumerates good works. You know, I was hungry. You gave me food. I was thirsty. You gave me a drink, whatnot. So the criteria for inheriting the kingdom here is not faith alone, but it's good works. And then he's going to say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for you by the devil and his angels. Mm -hmm. And apparently, uh, there's a separate, uh, this could be uh, at the great white throne, but I think it's at the uh, at the second coming of Christ in context at the parousia. Yeah. So <laughs> those on the left uh, are cursed and uh, will end up on the that's the that's the goat that's the goats right and they will uh, end up in the lake of fire and why well they didn't do good works uh, now th th this is the problem it seems that a failure to do good works instead of just unbelief in Christ right. is the criteria for sending them to hell. Mm -hmm. However, Paul explains that in Romans chapter one, okay. uh, that they uh, knew about the true God and what his requirements were, but they rejected it and made up their own God. Okay, right. So that's what's going on with these guys. Uh, they knew better. They, mm -hmm. they could have turned to Christ. There was sufficient evidence in creation. And Paul says in Romans two, in conscience, yeah. to have directed them to faith in Christ, but they ignored it. Mm. And so that's ultimately what he's talking about. Uh, now, then the verse at the end, uh, and and these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Right. Now, the eternal punishment is clearly the lake of fire mm -hmm. and eternal life here, I think, because he's talking about inheriting it. Mm -hmm. is more than just soteriological entrance into the kingdom, but it's uh, a full, richer experience of eternal life characterized by three things. Mm -hmm. uh, greater intimacy, greater opportunities to serve, mm -hmm. and greater honor. Mm -hmm. uh, well done, good and faithful servant, you know. Mm, right. And some are going to receive those three things and some are not. Mm -hmm. But the, the sheep will receive those things, and that is the reward to all those who have uh, uh, persevered in the life of good works to the end of life. So we're looking at this as, because, yeah, in verse 31, when the Son of Man come in his glory, we're looking at, like you said, the second advent of Christ. And so uh, would it be that these things that are happening are happening during the tribulation period? 
No, I think I just think it's a just well, yeah. They, during the they didn't do this stuff during the tribulation period because those are the people that uh -huh. are standing there. That said, we oh, know okay. from Daniel that Old Testament saints will be resurrected at this time. Right. So it's very possible that it's not just limited to the tribulation period, but you know that is the context. But we do know that according to Daniel, Old Testament saints will be there as well. Okay, so I, I I see what you're saying as far as because in he's sitting on the throne of his glory and before him is gathered all these people. Exactly. So this is a resurrection, if you will. Right. And it's not that these people are doing it during the tribulation period. It's that everybody that's standing before him exactly have either done this or not done this. Right. And then it's based upon rewards for those Christians or punishment for the unbelievers yeah and the reward is an inheritance reward and an enhanced right. experience of eternal life which involves three things uh, right greater opportunities for service honor well done good and faithful servant mm -hmm. and uh what's the third one <laughs> i just been talking about it uh, <laughs> see, uh intimacy greater intimacy participation in the uh wedding yep. banquet and the messianic banquet that inaugurates the kingdom i i, I like how you explain that I, to me it seemed like it's it's you know i haven't really fully studied it out obviously like you have but uh it seemed like these were people during the tribulation period doing it but i think you make a great point saying no these are people that uh he's sitting on his throne and they're standing before him it's not necessarily they've done it then is that these are just people that are standing before him at that time. And yeah. so I appreciate that. Uh, there's a question that somebody specifically wanted me to ask you once they found out that I was interviewing you. And it's in Revelation chapter 17, uh, verse number nine. And there's a description as far as a great harlot. And in verse number nine, it says, here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. Uh, there are some people that have the view that this what verse, who is this woman uh, that's being spoken of by John? And are these seven hills, uh, would you believe these are the seven mountains uh, that uh, Rome is said to sit upon? Uh, could you elaborate what your thoughts are on that? Well, you know, there's differences of opinion on that. I personally look at the seven hills as I think most people in the first century would have understood as a reference to Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, and the great harlot uh, is an apostate religious system. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think this is the Catholic church like a lot no. of people do. Okay, I think it refers to the system of worship inaugurated by the beast and the false prophet uh beginning at least in the middle of the tribulation mm -hmm. and uh this great harlot this apostate religious system had deceived and deluded many people and mm -hmm. it emerged out of the final form of the roman empire mm -hmm. uh, the toes <laughs> in daniel's <laughs> yeah. image and, yes. the, and the ten horns uh so all of these refer to some revival of old rome that's going to emerge out of uh well it would the location today would be western europe right I'm not saying it's the 10 nation confederacy or any of that could be mm -hmm. right i remember when we were in the 60s talking about this and reading hal lindsey's book ah there's 10 nations in the <laughs> european yeah. you know and i don't know uh, yeah right. i don't think there's enough in scripture to nail that down but it does seem that the remnants of the old roman empire would be in some kind of unity of, of the nations of eastern europe and it's from that group that the antichrist and the false prophet and the great harlot emerge okay so i like when, when you pointed out it seems like it's going to be a religion that the antichrist will set up because we we know that he's gonna he's gonna set up an image and, and cause people to worship the image and and uh during the tribulation period the middle part if you will and so there's this world religious system but not necessarily the catholic church but it may be in the general vicinity of where rome sits currently is what it 
sounds like well, that, that's my suggestion but yeah. i firmly I, I agree there's not a whole lot of specificity in this right. so we're just trying to piece together a lot of inferences from a lot of passage and this is a plausible one in my view but it sounds like you believe okay the antichrist would come from a european ethnicity rather than jewish or muslim is that correct uh correct uh yet a good argument could be made that the antichrist is jewish mm -hmm. And a good friend of mine, uh, Paul Tanner, who's a, a mm -hmm. wonderful Old Testament scholar, takes that view. Uh, I would tend to think that he is someone in alliance with the uh, nations of of of, uh, of Western Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the, and he could be a Syrian or a Persian. Okay, but there's a big alliance of these things. That's they're called the King of the North mm -hmm. in uh, Daniel chapter one eleven, and uh, so uh, you know, I'm not dogmatic on this, right? Because uh, I just don't think the Scripture gives us sufficient information to know for sure. But I acknowledge yeah. that there is a plausible argument that the Antichrist is a Jewish Antichrist. Hmm. Okay, excellent. Uh, one question I personally have, I'm trying to fully study it out a little more, is the New Covenant. Uh, the New Covenant, people will look at Jesus at the Last Supper uh, when he references a New Covenant. Uh, but I think a lot of times people overlook the fact that this New Covenant is also prophesied in the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 31. And Jeremiah does say that in those days, he's going to make a New Covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And he says that uh, after those days, he's going to put his law in their inward parts, write it on their hearts. And he talks about this aspect of like a, a pure ethical uh, lifestyle, if you will, during this day. Uh, could you explain what are your thoughts on the new covenant? Is this partially fulfilled? Is this pending fulfillment? Is this only Israel? Because it does say in verse 31 with the house of Israel and Judah. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the new covenant? Yeah, well, it was made with the uh, house of Israel, house of Judah. But, you know, the New Testament makes clear that that barrier between Israel and the church is gone. Mm, OK, so uh, anything that uh, would have spes, you know, limited just to the house of Judah mm -hmm. in Israel is now gone. And we've been grafted into the Abrahamic blessing, according to Romans 11. Right. So now we have become part of the covenants granted to Israel. And that includes the Davidic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, and the new covenant. So, uh, and I understand the problem about that day, because I think that day is specifically referring to uh, the day of the parousia and the coming kingdom afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, it looks like the benefits of the new covenant, because we've been grafted onto those promises, right. the cruise to the church as well. Mm -hmm. So the the benefits of that covenant have now been uh, granted to the body of Christ, the, the church of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, and in that sense, it has been inaugurated with the church and it will be fulfilled ultimately fully to Israel in that day. And, and what would you, how, how would you explain that day? Is that the return? That's the return of Christ. That's okay. what aim, That's what Jeremiah is talking about, mm -hmm. uh, in, in my view. But because the, the dividing wall of partition has been broken down, right. the church now participates in it, the new covenant, and it's inaugurated with them prematurely to Israel's full entrance into it at the parousia. So as, as opposed to replacement theology, which will teach that the church replaced Israel, this view is actually, it's still Israel, but the church is able to partake with Israel and exactly. we're grafted in. Yeah, you don't need to deny what the Old Testament says about the future of Israel. Right. The simpler solution is just to say, well, the wall of partition is torn down, mm. so the church now participates in that. Right. No, definitely. I, I appreciate that. And so <clears throat> I've always looked at Jeremiah 31 and Re Romans 11 and those passages of at, at that day, looking at uh, whether it's the Messianic kingdom, 
uh, when he establishes a thousand year reign in that this aspect of there's going to be a new heart in these people, because right. I know right now, uh, even as Christians, we don't know everything about Messiah. Obviously, Mess Messianic Kingdom does talk about we're going to be learning from Jesus uh, during, I think, passages and Isaiah talk about that. But even still today, we still have an evil heart that leads us astray at times, but it reveals in this day uh, that won't be the case. And, and I see that as the removal of the sin nature, you know, ultimately. Yeah, it won't exist in the resurrected body in the future kingdom. Amen. I can't wait for that. So Isaiah chapter 65, verse number 20. Uh, the very first time I've heard about this view, this was a view that I heard of through Furtenbaum. And it seems to be talking about during the Messianic kingdom and the thousand year reign. But in Isaiah 65, 20, it says there will be no more an infant of days, nor an old man that hasn't fulfilled his days for a child shall die a hundred years, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. Uh, from what I understand, fruit and bomb teaches the view that during this thousand year reign of Christ, the millennial kingdom, that people will have a hundred years to be able to receive or reject eternal life through Jesus Christ. Uh, could you explain what your views are on Isaiah 65, 20, uh, this hundred years, and how do people get saved during the millennial kingdom? Well, they get saved. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, this passage proves that there will be mortals uh, in the kingdom. Uh, there's going to be mortals along with those in resurrected bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but to draw from this that uh, you've got 100 years to believe in Christ, to me, that really is a stretch. Okay. They're yeah. saved in the millennium uh, just as we are by faith alone in Christ alone and turning to him uh, for forgiveness of sin. Mm -hmm. So there's no difference in the way of salvation. You can look at this like this. I remember Dr. Ryrie in one of his classes uh, said it like this. The basis of salvation throughout all history, including the millennium, is the shed blood of Christ, the finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. And the object and, and the means of salvation uh, all through history, including the millennium, is faith alone. Right. The object of faith in all history uh, is God. But the content of faith increases with additional revelation. Right. So the non-believers, these mortals in the kingdom who have not believed in Christ, mm -hmm. they got a thousand years to believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, uh, some of them are going to die, obviously, if a guy dies, some are only going to have 100 years if they die, only live that long. Right. But longevity is going to be restored. Mm. And, uh, but uh, they come to Christ the same way we do, by personal trust in the finished work of Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. <laughs> and so this is an aspect of, Okay, when we take a literal reading of Genesis and we see, okay, yeah, Methuselah is the oldest person ever lived, 969 years, I believe it is. And, and we know Adam was 130 before he had Seth, I believe it was. And so it does reveal during the kingdom, uh, the longevity of life's possibly going to be there as well. Uh, also, the aspect of it clearly teaches there's going to be, like you said, mortality. There's going to be some aspect of birthing uh, during the kingdom. And so uh, it, it's always been a fascinating question passage for me as far as how this happens. But I love what you said, that the object of faith is God. Uh, the only thing that really changes is the content of faith. Uh, back in the Old Testament, looking, you know, e even Forward. in the Old Testament, they weren't really looking to the cross uh, until a certain period because they didn't know anything about the crucifixion. And so progressively, they got more information. And now us in the church age, we're looking back to the cross. And so during a millennial, again, it's still going to be the blood of Christ that saves everybody. 
but the content uh, just changes. And I know that's one of the things that people get a misunderstanding of dispensationalism. They think that we teach people get saved differently. But I love that quote you mentioned from Dr. Ryrie as far as the object, the content, and, and how everything's the same except for the content that's progressively exactly. revealed. And yeah. so I appreciated that. So I only have two more questions left, if it's okay with you. Okay. Uh, but uh, one of them is after the millennial kingdom. So Jesus Christ comes back and he goes ahead and he bounds Satan for a thousand years. Then we read in Revelation chapter 20, verse four. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be released out of prison. Uh, a lot of people ask this question. Why? Why does God allow Satan to come back out to deceive the world and have this final revolt? Why wouldn't God just get rid of him once and for all? Why this season of life? Yeah, if you can find an answer to that one, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I have my own speculative thoughts because the scripture doesn't tell us right. you know, exactly. Um, the... Uh, the controlling principle of the mm -hmm. biblical philosophy of history is the second before the first humility instead of the lust for power. Mm -hmm. And uh, God is working that principle out ever since the Satan fell lusting for power and full of pride. Mm -hmm. And God uh, in each, uh, I'll use the dirty word, each dispensation whether it's law or the period of promise with the patriarchs, uh, he's bringing out the failure mm -hmm. of those who pursue power and pride. And there's always a uh, something hanging out there uh, that you can blame it on the environment. Okay. And, uh, of course, the situation with Adam and Eve refutes that. They had a perfect environment and they mm -hmm. sinned. They didn't have a sin nature. They had untested holiness, whatever that means. That's oh. what theologians say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then uh, you come into the millennium mm -hmm. and you've got, uh, again, a perfect environment. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got uh, a, uh, the deserts blossom. There are, the beasts no, are no longer carnivores. Mm -hmm. There's a righteous judge. Uh, there, the law has gone out all over the earth. There's social justice. Uh, there's no excuses for turning away. All right. Uh, it's possible that, you know, but but of course, you've got a whole army of people, or probably I don't know how many, but all those mortals that come into the kingdom mm -hmm. have to come to Christ. And their children have to come to Christ. And at the end mm -hmm. of a thousand years, there's going to be millions of them. Okay. And millions of unbelievers. Mm -hmm. So Satan has his final shot. And, God, and God's going to give it to him. To come out and deceive the nations. However, he's, just, he's, and he's going to get together this vast army of people. Mm -hmm. However, uh, he's not going to be successful. He's going to be annihilated thus judging pride uh, of the millions that have rejected Christ during mm -hmm. the millennium and the pride and program of Satan, uh, namely that the controlling principle of life is to seek personal gain and power. Mm -hmm. So this release of Satan to organize that army or that millions of people and then judge them right. uh, before they can do any damage uh, is the kind of the nail in the coffin to that philosophy of life. Now, I'm speculating here. Yeah. It does fit with the general tenor of scripture mm -hmm. about pride and uh, the need to quench it. But uh, that's the best I can do right now. Huh. So <clears throat> that's something I would really have to re-listen to this and chew on to really get the, the totality of what, what you've said. Is this something that you may have written down by any chance? Uh, actually, I'm working on a book called oh, yeah. A Brief History of Eternity right now. and uh, But I haven't completed it, and it's 
it's got a lot of work. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've got a chapter in there on the fall of Satan, and I can send that to you. Oh, that, that'd be awesome. I'd love to really uh, chew on what, what you were just saying as far as reason. L like you said, I appreciate your humility in saying that, you know what? It's all speculation on why God allows this to happen. We can read in Scripture what happens and how he deceives and has this final revolt, but the reason why, uh, that, that's all pure speculation. And we can have thoughts, but uh, at the end of the day, we don't want to say this is why if Scripture doesn't clearly say, because now we're trying to put words in God's mouth that could essentially be wrong. And uh, as you know, James chapter three, verse number one, he says, you know, let not many be uh, uh, teachers for in doing so you're going to incur a stricter judgment. And so the last thing I want to do is say, thus saith the Lord and the Lord never said. And so I appreciate your humility on that, but uh, fascinating thoughts on what you speculate the reason to be. And so, yeah, I'd love to get a little snippet of that. And, and ag again, just like the other two page paper, on discerning God's will or leading, uh, if it would be okay with you, and you could let me know offline uh, uh, if we can share that as well uh, sure. for other people. Sure, no, you can do it. That's no problem. Excellent. Now, final question I have for you. It's one that I've had uh, pretty often in Revelation chapter 22, verse number 15. And so uh, Revelation 21 uh, is talking about the new heavens and the new earth coming down. In Revelation 22, it still talks a little bit about the new heavens and the new earth. And then in verse number 15, well, we'll say 14. Uh, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to enter into, uh, have right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. Uh, and then he says, for outside are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves and makes a lie. This seems to be talking about inside New Jerusalem. Some people have access to the tree of life. And outside the city are these dogs, whoremongers, murderers, and things like that that don't have access. Uh, who are these people? What are your thoughts on Revelation twenty two fifteen? Are these people in heaven? Well, not heaven, but the new heaven and the new earth uh, that are here? Or is this something else? What are your thoughts? Well, um, you know, there's two views, uh, just like everything else. <laughs> uh, see, this is, uh, let me just get the verse in front of me. So yeah. I'm gonna open my Bible again. Now we're going to commit the fallacy of either or dilemma, <laughs> the false dichotomy is one or the other. <laughs> Okay. But it's a uh, fascinating verse. And so I'm I'm curious. I have my thoughts, but it's probably wrong. Uh so I'd be curious to hear yours as well. Okay. We're getting down to uh see what verse did, were you referring to? Uh starting at verse 14, Revelation 22, 14 and 15. And this is okay. one thing I love about you is, is the fact that uh if you don't already know uh, right away, you want to look at the scripture so that you can be honest with yourself, your theology, and scripture itself. And so I appreciate that about you, Jody, well, that you're not just you. rattling stuff off. You're trying to really uh, articulate your position and why. So thank you for that. Okay, let me look at starting verse four. Okay, yeah. yeah. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have a right to the tree of life. Okay, and they may enter the city gates. Outside are the dogs, the murderers, the idolaters, uh, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So who mm -hmm. are those guys? Yeah. Uh, now, let me see. I remember I thought through that once. Let me see if I can find what I believe. <laughs> it's an interesting uh, passage. <laughs> let me see here. Because I know for me, it does seem to point to an aspect of rewards that not, not everybody's going to have access to go into right. New Jerusalem. However, I think it's the Feast of Tabernacles that occurs in uh, New Jerusalem that is going to be kept. 
for eternity, according to Zechariah. And then we see it, I believe, in Revelation as well. And so if we have to get into New Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, which is commanded and we can't break a command, then who are these that don't have access to New Jerusalem? So is this a rewards thing or is this unbelievers? Okay, uh, it's coming back to me now. Yeah. Um, first of all, the uh, the phrase, some can enter by the gates mm -hmm. and some cannot. Now, entering by the gates is a reference for special honor. Okay. Only some have that privilege. And uh, the gates were the place of honor. That's where the elders sat, you know. Okay. And uh, and the only the only people that can get through are those who have washed their robes. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> that might be uh, like the Lord's instruction concerning the need to wash the feet that is daily confession of sin mm. now perhaps the only thing could be properly uh asserted here mm -hmm. uh well you you could argue it that that these people are the opposite of non-christian as any christian and not just overcomers okay uh, but those who enter enter uh by special honor are the overcomers okay so the opposite of the overcomer is what and... well it's those who didn't overcome right so it's possible that all of these uh horrible <laughs> things characteristics of these people yeah. uh are people that uh, uh did not persevere in good works did not confess their sins these are mm -hmm. mortals during the millennium mm -hmm. and therefore did not partake of the tree of life which means intimate fellowship with god eating is a metaphor for fellowship mm, okay. uh, not necessarily regeneration mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite natural to contrast the um uh, uh them with lukewarm you got lukewarm christians or oh. christians that have fallen away versus those who receive higher honor right just like in the churches of laodicea mm -hmm. uh you know they're spewed out of his mouth right see but they are members of the church now mm -hmm. i know that the uh, you know the theological systems come in and say well they couldn't have been uh believers because they didn't live like it well, that's just a system imposed on the deal. Yep. And uh, it's just as possible that there are true believers that uh, refuse to persevere to the end of life. Right. And, uh, you know, the conditions for becoming regenerate uh, mm -hmm. and becoming an overcomer are different. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the... Uh, uh, the regenerate person receives the water of life without cost in verse 17. Yeah. But in you know, a few verses later, he explains what, uh, what yeah. becoming an overcomer involves, becoming reward, right to eat the tree of life. And mm -hmm. that's going to cost everything. Yeah. So it, those, those people didn't enter by the gates. They didn't enter in victory and they're outside. And it's just part of the judgment that happens on uh, all those who are resurrected at the uh, parousia. Now, okay. that's that's my yeah. idea. Yeah, uh, that's a similar view that I hold, too, that this is an aspect of uh, those that are overcomers, which would make sense because that's a big theme within the book of Revelation. Right. And that, you know, you have a rewards and a blessing and a closeness of intimacy, like you were saying in verse 14, and then those that are not. And to me, the text does seem clear in the fact that it's contrasting those that have the right to the tree of life and into the city and those that don't. It's not that they're not there on the new earth. It's just there's a special aspect that some have access to uh, more than others yeah and so but regards I, I like what you said earlier that you know some of these things we just can't be dogmatic on you know 
and we can have our views. And that's why it's important in Acts chapter 17 to be a Berean, to study the things out, to see whether they are so, and draw our own conclusions. But uh, at the end of the day, if scripture is not clear on it, just say, this, these are my thoughts, you know, like what you said. And so I, again, I really appreciated that of you sharing your thoughts, sharing your understandings and, and then let me know what your speculations are in uh in the humility aspect of it so i do appreciate the time that you've given us you've given us an hour and a half and so i appreciate that i know you're probably a really busy guy uh as we wrap up and we finish up this interview is there any final words anything you'd like to share before we uh, uh say goodbye to everybody uh, just this, uh, there's a major revision of Final Destiny. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, there's quite a few changes, even mm -hmm. a couple of changes in interpretation from the one you have. Okay. And it's available on Amazon for my cost. Oh, okay. Which is 18 bucks. Yeah. Actually, I make nine cents on it. <laughs> <laughs> spender. So I spender. would uh, prefer that people uh, start buying that and refer to that in the future as my present view on all these things. And if you read through it and compare it with the one you've got, like that hardback, yep. uh, you, you know, the average person probably wouldn't pick up on the changes. You probably would. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, definitely. Well, uh, I'll be sure to link that particular one. Uh, yeah, I'll put a link up for that one. Yeah. What about Reign of the Servant Kings? Do we still link that one? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, again, okay. the, uh, the, the interpretations in Final Destiny on uh, many aspects differ from those in uh, Reign of the Servant Reign Kings. Of the Servant Kings. That's okay. You know, that was, that was my first effort. I spent eight years on Final Destiny and then another six on, uh, excuse me, on Reign of the Servant Kings, mm -hmm. then another six or seven on uh, Final Destiny, <laughs> where I began to tweak things. Well, well, since that's your most uh, recent views, uh, I'm not going to link these two at all. I'm going to link okay. the updated Final Destiny for you. That way, at least from C4C, people are getting uh, the most current views that you hold. And that's another thing I love about you, Jody, is the fact that you are okay with saying, you know what, this is what I believed in the past, but I've been convinced maybe to refine or tweak my views a yeah. little bit because that's what it's about not not at we don't have perfect knowledge of scripture and 99 percent of the things and so sometimes you know we're gonna have our views change or evolve whatever the case is and so i appreciate that about you that you're not very hard to say nope that's my view and we're gonna leave it that you're open <laughs> and humble enough to say hey don't buy these buy the current one for By the current, current one. <laughs> so I appreciate that about you. Uh, well, that's it for this episode. Uh, go ahead, like, comment, share, subscribe, yada, yada, yada. You know what to do. And uh, uh, check out the links for Dr. Jody Dello in the comments below. Check out uh, the B uh, ministry as well. And uh, thanks for sticking around. Until next time, God bless.